the place of the old-fashioned cat's whisker and two stages of LF amplification. That would be quite an elaborate set, but you could, by moving these bars around, do away with those stages and listen with earphones on there and save a lot of battery power. Oh, I see. When, when do they start enclosing all, all the working parts of the radios? Well, certainly by the mid-twenties, when uh, they decided that this wasn't really very nice in the living room, and so they started building it into familiar objects, uh, like the medicine chest, for instance, uh, where it could be easily disguised, and that wouldn't disgrace any respectable home. What other shapes? The... Well, the most famous of all, of course, is the smoker's cabinet. Every home had a smoker's cabinet. You'd have a your pipe racks and the bits at the top. It was smoking was big industry. You'd have your drawer at the bottom where you'd have your pipe cleaners and your matches and your tobacco. And it would all fold away and look quite innocent. It didn't scream wireless at you. Of course, all these early radios were powered by batteries, weren't they? Well, yes, sir. There was very little electricity around. And the early radios required a two-volt accumulator, sometimes four or six, but usually two, which had to be charged up every week. So that meant you had two of them one being charged, one in use, and you'd need a high-tension battery, you'd need a grid bias battery. The grid bias battery lasted about a year and cost nine pence. That would last about three months and cost you seven and six pence. So it was all quite expensive then? Wasn't it was an expensive business, and it took a lot of rigging up. You had to have an elaborate aerial and earth system, yeah. and all the bother of getting your accumulator charged every week. Admitted it was only fruitless and reasonably cheap, but it did mean you had to be careful. You had about 20 hours listening a week. So that when you went to your radio shop, there was usually a Radio Times provided on the counter. That saved you buying one. And with the aid of VF Bakelite fountain pen and a pad, you could make notes of what was worth listening to during the following week. So you could pick your programmes and plan your meals around the wireless set. You didn't just hear it, you actually sat down and listened to it and gave it all your attention. You had to, it would cost you so much to rig up. And of course, when you came in with your accumulator every week, there was all the other old uh, tabbers and rat bags in there changing the accumulators as well, and you would discuss the programmes. So the reputation of wireless programmes was made and lost in a wireless shop. By the 30s, the appearance of radios had started to change dramatically with the introduction of the new material, Bakelite. Pioneered in Britain by the Echo Company, this could be moulded to almost any shape. Its one drawback was that it was easily breakable. See these two portable radios? Well, watch this. Let her go, Betsy. Sorry, friend. You old-style portables have to go. But... Look at our new RCA Victor portable radio. Came through without a chip. RCA Victor's non-breakable impact case means no chipping, no cracking, no breaking. And hear that tone. It's RCA Victor's great golden throat sound. See the world's only portables with a non-breakable impact case as low as $27.95 at your RCA Victor dealer. The biggest change in broadcast radio since the war has been the introduction of FM. The great advantage is that it's much less susceptible to interference. The spark, which drowns out AM radio, is hardly audible on FM. Mr. Sasha, why should you use the phrase guerrilla warfare? Because there are... FM stands for frequency modulation. The principle behind it is really quite simple. Instead of the sound altering the amplitude of the radio waves, as in AM, it alters their frequency. FM radio was yet another invention of Howard Armstrong. He started work in the early 30s with a missionary zeal to produce true hi-fi radio. After encouraging tests with RCA, the company suddenly pulled out. Sorry enough! Well, why have you cancelled my project? Ah, get off my back. Hi-fi radio is nothing. the thing the TV future. Yeah. When FM radio was becoming established, Armstrong and RCA started a lengthy battle over the patents. Anyway, you have stolen radio. my ideas. He's you lying. did not. Uh, I was the inventor. No, certainly not. How, how can this had a disastrous that? effect on his health and on his marriage. Oh, I've had such a terrible day. By the way, I'm leaving. This is the last straw. 
I can't take any more. Uh... FM has now become firmly established and is invaluable for radio communications as well as for broadcasting. When I fly my little aircraft, I use radio. I personally wouldn't fly without one. This enables me to keep in touch with air traffic control and other air users and also airfields to tell them of your intentions. And if you do happen to get lost, air traffic control can help you find your way. And it also is a navigational radio. I can tune in to various fixed beacons throughout the country and I can fly directly to and from these beacons. And that helps immensely to find your way around the country. Domestic radios have also become much more sophisticated. Many now have automatic push-button tuning and the sound quality can be very impressive, particularly in stereo FM. But despite this improvement, radio has really been eclipsed by television and other modern marvels, and radio sets aren't the important prized possessions they once were. In fact, the whole idea of a separate radio set is rather disappearing. Radios now tend to be combined with uh, cassette tape recorders or alarm clocks or hi-fi systems. Radio is so taken for granted today, it's hard to think of it as magical anymore. But I hope in this programme I've managed to persuade you that it still is. Mm -hmm.